Episode number 99, Iron Man Lake Placid with Missy Norcross. Welcome to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. I'm Coach Terry Wilson, and with each episode, I bring stories of athletes to you that share their experiences at races in order for you to learn how to have your perfect race. We'll hear stories from athletes of all ages, abilities, and races of all distances. So regardless of where you fit in, there's something in there for you. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let the pursuit begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with my friend, Missy Norcross, about her recent race experience at Ironman Lake Placid in beautiful upstate New York, where she had an amazing time of 10 hours, 58 minutes, 32 seconds. Missy has been doing triathlons for just a few years now, and this was her second attempt at this distance. This race took place on July 22nd, 2018, and the temperature on race day was 46, and rose to 79, and the water was 74 degrees. Also notable to mention about this year's race at Lake Placid was pouring rain and hail on the bike course. Welcome to the show, Missy. I look forward to hearing about your race experience at Lake Placid. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So what made you want to do this race again? I know you did it last year. Yeah, um, I felt like I still had a lot to give on the course. I didn't last year. My attempt was my first um, attempt at the full Ironman distance and you know, I had a few issues with nutrition. It wasn't um, a great race for me, and I just felt like I could come back and do better. Um, also, it was the twentieth year, so it was kind of a big, kind of a big deal. I thought it would be a special year to be there, so I was just excited to try again. Nice. So, yeah. how was your training going into this race? It was great. Um, so, after Placid last year, I just kept um, a you know, a pretty good base. I ran a marathon in the fall. I had a good performance there. Not my best, but you know, it was good. And then starting in January, I just, um, put my head down and followed the plan and didn't miss a workout and got it done. Nice. So what kind of plan are you using? So I work with QT2 systems. Um, I'm one of their mission plan coached athletes and they provide me with, um, all the workouts and also a nutrition, um, consultation. So, um, I just use their resources. Nice. I haven't heard of anyone using their mission plan. What's that? So their mission plan is like a step down from the one-on-one coaching. It's a more affordable option. Um, and basically you get, um, you get your plan. It is personalized for you that you get a um, questionnaire that you fill out. They ask you all of your key events, um, what your strengths and weaknesses are, uh, what your training volume, what kind of training volume you can handle. And then they go ahead and write a, a individualized plan for you. And then you have access to um, a coach to ask questions for, to um, in like a, a forum setting on their website. So it's not you can't um, call up and speak with a coach one on one. You don't have a person who's working just with you, but you still have access to a coach in their in their system if you need to ask questions um, or if, you know, anything comes up that you're worried about that you want to talk through anything like that. That's pretty good i didn't know that really yeah. existed honestly it's a great option it's it's super affordable and you know you still get a great plan and access to a coach if, if anything comes up that you need it for so i thought it was perfect okay now going into lake plastic this year what was your longest swim bike and run workouts um my longest swim well my longest swim was supposed to be a 4900 but i'm not the type of person that can go swim 4900 and not swim another 100 to make it 5000 so that was my longest swim workout was the 5,000, um, in the pool. And my longest ride was, uh, six hours and 20 minutes. I think I made it 113 or 14 miles on that ride. Wow. And, uh, yep. Um, my longest run day was, I ran 21 miles, but it was a split workout. So I ran 10 and a half miles and then I got on the bike for an hour and then I got back out and ran another 10 and a half. Okay. Yeah. Now, Going into this Lake Placid adventure, what workouts did you do that gave you the confidence to go into this race prepared? Um, I think the workouts that give me the most confidence are the long rides and then um, followed by the run off the bike um, on the weekend. So, you know, being out there for five hours, five hours and 15 minutes, five hours and 30 minutes, five hours and 45 minutes, all the way up to six hours and 20 minutes. And then getting off and running for, I'm um, usually my transition run for those for those workouts were um, an hour, an hour and ten minutes. Um, so just being able to do that, especially through some of the really intense weather 
we had in New England this summer. We had a lot of really hot and humid days. Um, so just being able to do those workouts and, and get off the bike and still run well when the conditions were, were tough, I think was uh, probably a key part of the training this year. Okay. Now, did you miss any training going into Lake Placid? I did not. I'm not, I'm very, I mean, I think like a lot of triathletes, um, and a lot of marathoners, I'm, I'm pretty type A. If it's on the plan, I'm going to do it. Um, you know, I won't do anything crazy. Obviously, if I was sick or injured, I would have made modifications, but I was really lucky this year. I stayed healthy. Um, I didn't have any injuries. I never got sick. And so I just, um, I did all the workouts. Okay. So going into like Placid this year, what was the most hours that you trained in one week? My max training volume was just over 24 hours wow. uh, on my peak week. Yep. When you're not training or racing, what are you doing? Um, I have two little children. Um, they are five and seven years old, two girls. So I am spending time with them. Um, I do a lot of my training early in the morning to uh, be able to, you know, be done by the time they get up, give them breakfast, get them off to school. Um, in the summertime, they're very gracious and let me get my workouts done. They're really good. They just kind of play and wait for me. They know the drill. Um, so I do that. I spend a lot of time with my kids. We try to, you know, make every minute count, do fun things together. Um, support my husband who is a marathoner, um, as well. So we'll get out there and watch his events. And, um, and I also have a part-time job. I work 20 hours a week from home. Okay. Um, so be between all of that, um, I have a lot going on. That's enough. Right. So how do you manage the life work balance? I try to do, um, a lot of early mornings. I'm pretty much up at four, um, every day, um, to get my coffee in and then, you know, go down and get on the bike or go out for a run. And usually I try to wrap everything up by eight or eight thirty so that I can be available for the kids and their activities and get them to school and, or just hang out with them in the summer when school's out. So it's a lot of early mornings. Um, but I also have a really, really excellent support system. I'm very lucky. Um, my parents, my mom and dad live here in my house with me. We have an in-law apartment for them. So they live with us. So if I am working out and the kids happen to wake up, they can go into see grandma and grandpa and get their breakfast. Um, and my mom really, really helps out. I wouldn't be able to do it without her. And my husband on the weekends is basically like a single dad. You know, I take off early in the morning on Saturday for a long workout and I don't come back for seven or eight hours. And he just takes the reins and takes the kids and gets everything done that needs to get done at home. So I'm really, really lucky I have I have the support and help that I do. Wow, that's amazing. A lot of folks don't have that. I know. I'm so lucky. I'm so thankful. Right. Now, were there any days where you just mentally didn't want to train or get on the bike or the workout seemed daunting and you just didn't want to do the work? You know, I've had days like that in previous training cycles, but I really did not have that um, this time around. I just... The way that the plan works for me, you know, it's a really easy, not easy, but the way that everything ramps up is it doesn't seem overwhelming all at once. So I try to really just focus on what that one workout is for that day and not think too far ahead about what I have coming up, what the big weekend looks like, that kind of stuff. Really just take it one, one workout at a time, one sport at a time. And I think that mentality helps me not feel like it's daunting or I've got too much to do. Um, also I just really love it. Um, I, I just love getting on the trainer and hammering out a good workout. Um, you know, that feeling afterwards, if I, if I don't get that in the morning, it's just not, I'm not having the, a good day. So I really, I really didn't have any, any days where I just felt like, Oh God, I don't want to do this. Um, I was just really into it this season, which was fun. Good. So why do you do endurance sports? I mean, you seem to enjoy it and like the thrill of, pushing past your limits but why do you do endurance sports in the first place i just like it and um you know i'm i'm good at it i i kind of just i didn't ever think that i would i would really excel at it i've never been i mean i swam when i was in high school on the swim team but i wasn't the strongest swimmer on the team and i'm relatively new to cycling um so i never i always feel like i'm kind of playing catch up with the cyclists who have more experience than me and you know i'm i'm a decent runner that's my strength but i never really thought i'd be able to run as well as i do kind of coming off the bike at the end of the day 
So I really just kind of surprised myself. Um, and then I, I, you know, I'm good at it. And I think that keeps it fun for me. Um, it keeps it exciting. And I'm constantly kind of just like surprising myself. Um, and, and that keeps me coming back for more. I want to see, I, you know, what else can I do? How far can I push it? How far can I go? Um, and that's, you know, what keeps me kind of moving forward. Okay. Now, going into Lake Placid this year, what was your taper like? So I did um, I did the Syracuse um, 70.3, which they've now canceled, sadly. Um, and that was five weeks before the race. So I recovered for a week after that. And then I did my two weeks of big builds. So I did, I think I did the t- a 22-hour week and then the 24-hour week. Um, then I had a down week of about maybe 12 hours. And then I bumped up again to about 16 and a half hours. And then I tapered down, um, the final week, you know, the final days before the race, I only did maybe about five or six hours of really light intensity workouts, um, the week of the race. Okay. So going into this race, when did you start traveling from the Boston area to Lake Placid? We left um, on Thursday the 19th, um, and then the race was on Sunday the 22nd. Okay. Now, whenever you got to Lake Placid this time, it was almost like you were returning back for a little bit of revenge to kind of get redemption from a not-so-great last year race, but it was a good, solid race overall. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great first attempt, but I definitely fell apart on the run, so I wanted to beat that course. Right. Now, whenever you got there, did y'all get like an Airbnb, a hotel? What was that like? Um, we rented a house. So I was, I'm very lucky to have been able to travel with, um, three other athletes this year. And we rented, um, a large house. We had at at our max, we had about 24 people. Um, so the, the four athletes, including myself and a bunch of family members, um, bunch of kids all staying in, in a, in a big house just outside, about five miles outside of downtown Lake Placid. Okay, so just far enough away where you're not in the nervous and anxiety level of the race and just close enough where you're a pretty quick drive away. Right, exactly. Okay, now whenever you got to the village this time and checked in, how was the check-in process for you? It was great. It was exciting. Um, you know, this it was a little more crowded this year. Last year we came up and checked in and did all that on the Wednesday before. Um, but this year we pushed it all back and, and came on Thursday. So it was a little more crowded getting through, um, the check-in, but it was great. I mean, they just have it so organized and they just have such a system that even though it is crowded, you just get, you know, right through check-in, get all your stuff and, and you're, you've got your wristband on and you're out the door before you know it. Wow. Now for this race, what kind of swag did they give you? We got, um, there were a few kind of random things in the swag bag at, when you registered. We got, um, like a, a dry, a wet and dry bag, um, that had a local hotel's name on it. There was a sleep mask in there. We got the standard, uh, poster for the day. We got the flag for the day. Um, we got a couple of samples from Cliff. I think we got a, uh, sleeve of Cliff blocks and a Cliff bar of some sort some kind of new cliff bar that I ate and was delicious actually. Um, and that's pretty much all that was in the bag, I think. Okay. Now, whenever y'all got there, did y'all do another workout when you got to the race venue? I did. So we got there on Thursday. I had, um, six swim on Friday morning. I did about 1100 in the lake on Friday morning, which was great. Mirror Lake is so beautiful and so nice. And that's always a, like a really fun part of being up there as athletes in Mirror Lake before the race um, starts. It's just a good vibe. Everybody's excited to be there and swimming. Um, and then I had, uh, I think I had about a 40 to 45 minute, um, just quick spin on the bike, really easy effort and a 20 minute run. So I did that all on Friday and then Saturday I just had a rest. Okay. So the day before the race, what were you doing that day? I was eating a lot of carbohydrates and um, I took a nap and that pretty much in- took up the whole day. And also I had to, you know, bring my bike uh, for bike check-in, but that was my main activity of the day. Okay. So what were you having for breakfast? For breakfast, I actually ate two bagels um, and I had some jelly on those bagels. 
Um, and I had a glass of orange juice. Okay. Were you trying to get a certain meal in for dinner? Um, I did. So I had my whole day planned for food and I wanted to hit about 500 grams of carbs for the day, um, both on Friday and Saturday. So I had planned out how I was going to do that. Um, I got in, I think probably close to 500, if not a little more. Um, and so dinner was, uh, had two cups of pasta with about just two ounces of chicken. Um, and I had a little bit of zucchini in there just cause I like to have something green, but I don't want to go too crazy on, on green veggies the night before a race. Um, and that was it. Okay. Now you're getting your stuff ready for the next day where you're bringing all your, of your bags. What all are you putting in all of your bags? So I just had standard stuff in my T1 bag. Um, so, you know, my bike helmet, my cleats, my socks, um, and my sunglasses. And I had packed sunscreen in there, but we definitely didn't need sunscreen for that bike ride um, on race day. I don't drop a bike special needs bag. I, I carry all of my um, nutrition with me on the bike. And I also just I just try to use what's on the course. I train with Gatorade, um, Gatorade Endurance uh, when I ride. So that makes it that much easier. I don't have to worry about packing any extra bottles or anything like that. So I skip the bike, the bike um, special needs. Then in my um, T2 bag, I just had my um, racing shoes and a clean pair of socks. Um, I actually made the decision to change out of my um, kit shorts this year and just put on a regular pair of running shorts, which are, I think, more comfortable for me at least. Um, and that's it. And I, uh, I also didn't use a run special needs bag. So just, just pretty basic. I try not to overthink it and keep it pretty simple. Okay. Now, whenever you wake up on the morning of the race, about how much sleep do you think you got? Um, I tried, so i definitely made sure to take a nap on Saturday, the day before the race, I was able to get in about two or two and a half hours of sleep just during the day. Um, cause I was afraid I would not at night so I wanted to make sure I got a good nap in um, and then I just laid down probably around 8 30 9 o'clock and I was up and down a little while but you know I wear the Garmin that tracks my sleep and it told me I, I got about five hours and 56 minutes of sleep the night before the race so I thought that was pretty good oh wow so you wake up on race day what what time is your wake-up call I got up at 3 30 wow that's really early <laughs> Yeah, it was early. I wanted, I needed to have enough time to eat. Um, I wanted to get my breakfast in and get enough time to digest before, before we headed down to transition, which opened at uh, four forty-five. Okay. Now, what's your race day morning ritual like before you leave where you're staying? Um, so I just get up and drink coffee. Um, I do that every morning. I know some athletes will try to limit their caffeine before the race, but. I'm pretty caffeine sensitive. So even if I have caffeine in the morning in coffee, I still feel like I get a little zip when I have the caffeinated gels and caffeinated fuel on the course. So I don't cut caffeine out of my diet um, before the race. So I just had coffee and um, ate breakfast. And then we all put our um, put our race, our tri tats on and uh, got our race numbers on and took a few pictures and out the door we went. Okay. Now you get to transition. Did you hit a lot of traffic? No, not at all. Um, we were able to find a good parking spot. We had to walk um, a little ways, maybe a quarter of a mile, but um, we didn't have very much traffic at all. So that was good. Okay. Now you get to transition. You're going over your bike, looking around, making sure that everything is set the way you want it to be set. Yep. How are you setting up your transition? So I... Um, Made sure that my tires were pumped. I had let a little air out of the tires when I racked it on Saturday because Saturday was a really warm day and I didn't want to, you know, come into a blown tube in the morning on Sunday. So um, I, I didn't bring my pump, but I figured there's tons of athletes in there with pumps. So I just borrowed a pump from a fellow athlete, um, got my tires back up to around 100 PSI where I like it. Um, I put all my nutrition on my bike. So I just filled, I have a speed fill that holds 40 ounces um, on my frame. So I just filled that with Gatorade, um, endurance. Um, I used the orange flavor cause that's what they have on the course. And then I packed my, uh, bento box on the bike with goose. I think I had maybe seven or eight, um, goose in there. I had alternating, uh, one caffeinated, one non-caffeinated, um, goose. So I just put all that in there. Um, and then I just put my bike computer on, um, on the, on the mount. And that was it for, for right there at the bike. Um, and I didn't make, I had already dropped off my um, special needs bag. So I didn't, I mean, my transition bag. So I didn't make any changes to those. Okay. So that was it. Pretty basic setup. Okay. What kind of bike computer are you using? 
I am using the uh, Wahoo Kicker, um, and I really love it. Oh, no, not the Kicker. Sorry, the Wahoo Element. Okay. Yeah. So for this, do you have a power meter that you're using? I do. I have a um, a power tap in the rear hub um, on both my training wheel and my race wheel. Nice. Yeah, it's nice. Now, were you wanting to hit a certain normalized power or power number for this course? Yep. So I had a power goal of about um, 150 watts. I think I ended up averaging about 158 watts. So I did a little better than I thought I would. Okay. Now, you leave transition and head down to the swim start. Yep. You know it's wetsuit legal by this point. Yes. It's about a half mile walk down there. What yep. was your mindset at this point? Were you getting nervous or anxious? What was that like? I was getting nervous. It's really, I think it's hard not to get nervous um, at any um, swim start. You know, everybody's just kind of standing there in their wetsuits and, you know, the energy level is so high um, and just the anticipation of what's going to, what's going to happen for the day. What's it going to be like? You know, I just, I don't want to wish the race day away because I really have a lot of fun out there um, on the course during the day, but I just really wanted to like be at the end of it and know what was going to happen. So I was definitely feeling excited and feeling anxious. And, um, but also I was just really happy. I really love standing in the swim corral and just talking to the people around me and seeing where people are from. And you just hear the most amazing stories about, you know, people doing their ninth or 10th, um, Ironman distance and just, you know, things that they went through to get to the start line. And it's, it's a great opportunity, I think, to just strike up a conversation and make some new friends with the people that you're going to be sharing the day with. Right. Now, this is a rolling start, and it's a beach yes. rolling start. Yep. And it's a two-loop swim where you get out in the middle, and then you go back for a second loop. There right. is a yellow cord or cable, basically, that you can side off of as well. Yep, yep. And this is a really beautiful lake, almost clear for the most part. Yeah, it's a great lake. And this is your second time doing this race. Where did you see yourself for the rolling start? So my goal was to swim about, I, I wanted to swim about 108. Um, and so I seated myself in the, um, there was a one um, one hour to 110 um, sign. So I just tried to go towards the back of that group. Um, I, I always ask the people around me what they're planning to swim. Um, or what they're hoping to swim because I, I just want to make sure I'm not going to get clobbered or, or blocked, basically. Um, and all the people around me had said that they were hoping to swim about 105, so maybe a little faster than I thought I would swim, but I felt like I was in um, in a good spot. So that's where, I, that's where I seated myself. Okay. Now, knowing that there was basically what they call an Australian kangaroo jump or whatever for this, where you get out and get back in, uh -huh. Did you do any type of training that where you would get out of the pool, do some jumping jacks, and then get back in the pool to kind of prepare for that? Nope, not at all. Um, and I actually do very little open water swimming in my training. My first open water swim of the day of the season was at the Syracuse seventy point three um, in June, and uh, my second open water swim was in Mirror Lake two days before the race and my third open water swim for the season was on race day. So I'm very lucky. I know a lot of people have. Um, open water swim anxiety. Um, but that, that just is not a problem for me. And I feel very comfortable in the water, um, open water. And so I do most of my training in the pool and I don't really make many, um, accommodations for, for changes for open water. Okay. Now the gun goes off. How is your mindset at this point going into the actual race? Are you wanting to go out there and just crush it do you have a time expectation or a time goal that you're wanting to get for the for the day or for just the for the swim for the day yeah for the day I was so last year I finished in 11 hours and 39 minutes which you know again is a, a pretty good time I was happy to be under 12 but I really felt like I bled a lot of time at the end of the run last year so this year I thought um you know if I have a really good day and can come in under 11 hours that that would be amazing. Um, and so that's, that's what I was aiming for. It was to come in under 11. Um, and then, so for the swim, I was hoping I could do around 108. Um, and I ended up doing a little faster than that. I think I swam like 107, 30 something. Right. Mm -hmm. So you get in the swim, how's the swim go for you? Uh, the swim was 
wonderful. Last year's swim was a complete washing machine. Um, there were, it just felt like there were so many people everywhere, but this year was great. I was able to be right on top of the cable. Um, I didn't really run into that many people. Um, you know, I had to swim around a few people here and there, but really not many. I felt like I had a lot of, of room. Um, and I was able to just get comfortable and get into my normal rhythm, my normal breathing pattern. And the great thing about being able to at least see the cable, even if I wasn't right over it, um, is that I just didn't have to sight. Um, so I could really just find a rhythm and, and a pattern and just, and just settle in and, and go for it in the swim. And so that's what I did. I just stayed really comfortable and really relaxed. Um, and I felt great. Nice. Now yeah. you get out of the water and you make your way to the wetsuit peelers here. Are yep. they in the sand again this year? They were in the sand. Yep. Wow. So did you take advantage of them? Of course. Yeah. I have a really hard time getting my wetsuit off. Maybe that's the only disadvantage that I have for myself because I don't do a lot of open water swimming in my training. I, I should probably do some wetsuit uh, removal uh, practice more than I do. But I know that the strippers are going to be there and they just, you know, they just, you just lay down and they just rip that thing right off you. So it was great. Nice. Now, did you experience any chafing from the wetsuit? So I actually do, um, my wetsuit has kind of a funky seam, um, right on the back of my shoulder blades. And so I get a chafing spot on the back of my, of each shoulder blade every time I wear the wetsuit and no amount of body glide or chafex or Vaseline or anything seems to help. Um, so I just, I expected it. I knew it was going to happen. Um, the only good part about it is that it's not in a place where my, that touches my kit or anything like that. So it just happens during the swim and then I don't really notice it until after the race. Okay. What kind of wetsuit is this? It's a zoot. Um, I don't even know what the model is. It's probably about 12 years old. Um, I could, I could stand to upgrade my wetsuit. (laughs) Right. Do you plan on upgrading before the end of the season? I don't. Um, so now for Kona, it's not wetsuit legal. So I did, um. I did purchase a swim skin before Lake Placid because it had been so warm that we were worried it wasn't going to be a wetsuit legal swim. So I've got the, the swim skin to swim in um, for Kona, and uh, maybe next year I'll think about upgrading um, my wetsuit. Okay. Now, you get to T1. It's about a half a mile away on the carpet through the yes. roads there. You go up a hill, down a hill, then up a hill, then down a hill, getting into yep. T1. How did T1 go for you? T1 was great. And I have to tell you that that, that run from Mirror Lake to T1 at the, on the Lake Placid course is probably one of my favorite parts of the race. There are just thousands of people lining that quarter mile run um, from the water to the, to the transition. And everybody is just screaming. And I mean, the energy is unbelievable. That is my favorite part. One of my favorite parts of the race. It's just amazing. Um, I love that part. Now, so. Go ahead. Nope, go ahead. Nope, sorry, go ahead. Did you notice the difference between last year and this year, being that it was the 20th anniversary? Um, You know, I didn't really notice a difference, but I think that uh, there was definitely good crowd support, but it wasn't anything over the top, and I think maybe the weather played into it a little bit um, because it was pretty miserable and rainy out um, while we were in the water, which is fine when you're out swimming, but it's not great for just kind of standing around and spectating. I mean, don't get me wrong. There were a lot of people, um, but I don't feel, I feel like maybe there would have been more if the weather was a little better. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, are you wearing socks for the bike ride here? I do. I do wear socks for the bike ride. Yeah. Okay. Now you get to your bike and head out. Did a volunteer have your bike in hand for you? Yep. So, um, you know, I got into the, into the tent, um, for T1. It was chilly in the morning. So I wanted to wear arm sleeves. So I had my, um, the volunteers were right there. They, they basically put my socks on, they put my arm sleeves on for me. I got my shoes on. Um, and I, you know, got out into the, into the, uh, area where they have all the bike racks. I was lucky enough to have somebody, um, walk my the aisle for me um and so i just i just grabbed it turned the computer on and and ran over to the mount line okay now you get onto the bike ride how was your mind at this point were you still feeling excited were you just ready to get into a groove what was that like yeah i was really excited um you know the the energy from that run from the swim to the to the transition just really pumped me up so i was definitely still feeling just super excited for that and 
and excited to see, I was just excited to see how the ride would unfold. There were a few changes to the course this year that I didn't get a chance to preview um, ahead of time. So I was excited to see what those would be like, what that would bring. Um, and I was a little nervous about the weather, um, but you know, I, I just feel like um, I, maybe I might have been a little more more nervous about the weather ahead of time. But once I actually get going, I just kind of don't really think about it. And I just, you know, I'm on my bike and, and off I go. And I just try to think about, you know, getting up the next hill or down the next hill or what the next turn is and just moving forward. Okay. Now, I know coming out of the transition area, you have a downhill down the ramp, the basically yep. the bus ramp. And then yep. you make a little hairpin turn. Then you take a right going down this massive hill. Did right. you have your bike in a certain gear to prepare for that? I definitely um, – I did not, no. And I didn't anticipate that I would be, like, really pedaling at that point either. Um, you know, I just wanted to make it down that hill safely. They, It's a really steep hill. There is um, uh, a sharp turn at the end. There are um, hay bales there, which means people have missed the turn in the past. So, really, I didn't want to, like, blow my whole race in the first – hundred yards of the of the ride um so i was definitely taking it easy on that first hill just kind of coasting and i really didn't start even pedaling on my bike until i got um past that part okay now this is a two-loop bike course how does the first 70 miles of this bike ride go for you um it went really well uh it was you know the weather wasn't great it was the first 10 miles or so when you're climbing you're basically climbing out of lake placid and and towards um towards the peak where before you start the keen descent um so it was it was windy there and it was rainy so that that part of the course was tough um the good part is once we started heading down keen um and got lower in elevation the weather changed um it was not as windy it was not as wet um so that i was really happy about that um and then once you get to the bottom of the keen descent, you make a turn and you've got a good 20 miles or so of just nice and flat road. Um, so I felt like that was where the race really started for me. I was able to just settle in and get into get into my aero bars and really just um, have a good consistent ride for, for that portion of the course. Um, and then um, after that 20 miles or so of flat section, you make a turn and there's some significant climbing. And then this year they had to move the, where the, um, there's an out and back portion of the ride. So that was a new, a new section. Um, but I really enjoyed that section. The road was repaved. Um, it was scenic. Um, it was quiet. It was nice there. I think there was maybe about a hundred, um, additional feet of climbing on that out and back versus the one that we rode in 2017 and in previous years. Um, but it was very rolling, um, and I'm used to kind of rolling hills and terrain, um, being from New England. So it was, you know, roads that I was used to riding. Um, and then, so after that, you start to climb back up, um, back up to Lake Placid. And that's really my, my favorite part of the course. It's really, um, it's rolling, but it's beautiful. There's just a, a gorge and waterfalls. And, you know, if you just take a second to look around at the scenery, it's just a really beautiful place to ride so that. That always carries me through that back half of the climbs back up to, to Lake Placid. Um, so I had a really good first loop. Um, I think I did the first loop in just under three hours. Um, so I was pretty much right around where I wanted to be. Wow. So now then, after the first 70 miles go, you were nailing your nutrition, your hydration, your just a touch over your power plan. Mentally, was this becoming a little bit more taxing? I would say the most mentally taxing part of the course was between miles, um, probably 60 to 75. Cause now you've come through town. Everybody, everybody cheers. It's really exciting. You see all the spectators and then you get back out. Um, and now you're climbing back up towards, um, towards the top before you make the keen descent. And at this point the um, on the climb, it was windier and there was more rain and there was hail and it was just really a grind for the maybe the first 45 minutes to an hour of that second loop on the course. So that that part was tough. I mean, I, I think um, I just drew a lot of strength in that time from the other athletes on the course around me. I think, you know, that one of the nice things, not the nice thing, but when there is bad weather, you know, I just think all the athletes are dealing with this together. It's not like it's just I'm having a bad day. No, this is something that everybody is dealing with together. So that kind of makes me feel a little bit better mentally, at least about, um, about riding when the conditions are tough. And, you know, I had some nice friendly banter with other riders around me as we were struggling through the hills and the hail. 
Oh, really? Um, and just kind of commenting about how how kind of ridiculous it was. Um, and and you know, but but we made it. And I think one thing that pulled me through was I just knew from the first loop that once I got to the top and started to descend and got got lower in elevation, that the rain and the wind would be better. Um, and they were. So once I got once I got back down the hill, um, it was def- the conditions improved a lot, um, and it was better. Good. Yeah. Now you get through mile 110 or so, you're almost done with the bike. Yeah. How was your mental plan of wanting to get off the bike successfully and have a quick T2? Cause you had been on the bike for just a touch over six hours at this point. Yep. I was definitely ready to get off the bike. I don't think there's anybody um, who finishes 112 miles. Who's like hankering for a few more miles. I was, I was definitely ready to get off, but you know, on the other extreme, I know there's people who, you know, get off the bike and, and tell the people in transition there to, you know, take the bike away. I never want to see it again. And I didn't really feel that way. Um, I was just excited that I had, I had done a good ride. Um, I had made it through a race, uh, without any mechanical issues. I'm always so thankful for that at the end of a, at the end of a, the bike portion. If I am able to make it through without any mechanical issues or any flats or anything like that, I'm just, Super, I was super thankful for that. Um, and I was excited to just get out on the run. The run was where I really lost it last year. And I just, I wanted to get out there and, and, you know, have that, have that chance to try again. Okay. Now, did you have any cramping or GI issues at all? I did not. No, I was wow. very lucky. Yeah. Did you stop and use the restroom at all on the bike ride? Nope, I did not. Okay. Nope. Now, for the run course goes, we know that it's basically a smiley face and all the hills are on the left side of the smiley face. Yep. <laughs> and then the right side of the smiley face is mostly flat. I say mostly because yep. there's a few rollers over there, but yeah, that's where the mental part of you have to be tough mentally is over on the right side because there's right. really no support over there. Yeah, there's not. I mean, there's a lot of volunteers out there, which is great, but they don't, they don't let spectators um, onto river roads. So it's just, it's just the volunteers or um, people who li- actually live on river road who come out and sit in their yards and watch the runners go by. But right. it's pretty, it's pretty quiet. Now, how does the first mile or two go of this run course for you? Um, it went good. The first mile or two in Lake Placid are tricky because there's a significant elevation loss. Um, and, you know, you're you're coming off the bike and excited. So, I mean, it's really easy to blow your whole race in the first three miles of the run on the plastic course by just going down those hills way too fast and blowing out your legs before you even really get a chance um, to get them under you. So I really wanted to make sure that I did not do that last year. I did. I went way too fast in the first three miles and I paid for it really hard in the end. So I, I was definitely not going to make that mistake again. Um, I do not, I'm, I, I run by heart rate. I don't watch my pace. So I just flip my watch over to the heart rate and just made sure that I was staying in zone one, um, and the low end of zone one for me, um, and just made sure that I kept it there basically for the duration of the run. Okay. So what does that look like for you? Um, so my heart rate, uh, for zone one is about 134 to 144. So I was trying to keep it between like 137 and 140. Um, for most of the run. And then I thought to myself, you know, if I've got anything left in the last, you know, three or four miles, I'll try to get it up a few beats. And, and I did, I think I managed to get up to maybe around like 145, maybe 146, um, in the last mile or so, but I had a lot of energy left. I was hauling. It was good. Okay. Now for your heart rate zones, are you using a five zone system, a seven zone system? What does that look like? I have a recovery zone, a zone one, a zone two, and a zone three. Um, but to be completely honest, in my training, all I ever use is recovery and zone one and zone two. I never um, do anything more intense than a zone two, and only for short periods of time am I in zone two. Okay, so in a sense, you only have four zones. Yes, yep. Okay. Now, whenever you start getting down to about miles eight through ten of the run course, how are you mm-hmm. feeling at this point? I was still feeling really good, but you know, um, for, for on the plastic course, when you're still at miles eight and 10, you haven't gotten to the hard part yet. You're still out on river road. Now you've done all this downhill. You've gone out on river road, which is flat. You've made your way back and now you've got to climb, you know, from, for, for four miles back up to, back up to town. Um, and so I was definitely feeling nervous. I didn't want to, you know, blow it on the hills 
you have a, you still have a really long way to go. It's really early in the race. And so I did, I just stuck to my plan. I watched my heart rate on the way up the hills. I told myself if I got over, um, you know, 150 or so just while I was up the hill that I would walk. Um, but I di- I didn't, I took a, I took it really slow. I, I ran it maybe, maybe peaked at like 144 or so on the way up the hills. It was, you know, it was a slow run, but I was still running and, um, and I felt good. I felt good about it. They, they didn't take everything out of me. Like, uh, like I was worried they might. Okay. Now, did you have any cramping or GI issues on the run course? I did not. I have learned my lesson through trial and error that I can't, while I can drink Gatorade, um, until I, I mean, I can drink a ton of Gatorade on the bike. There's no limit to the amount of Gatorade I can drink on the bike. But when I run, I cannot drink any Gatorade. I can only drink water. Wow. Um, and I've just learned that through trial and error and through marathoning and other races. And But I'm so happy that now I have that figured out and I know what works for me. So as long as I just drink water um, and I take a um, – I eat one cliff block every two miles and I take um, one goo at miles uh, 8, 16, and 24 – um, and that was my plan and that's what I did. And, and that worked for my stomach. So yeah, that was good. Okay. So looking at the support on the course, what was the funniest thing that you saw from an athlete's point of view? So there was one athlete this year who had, um, probably the most hardworking support crew that I've ever witnessed on any race course ever. I can't even tell you the number of signs that these people put up for this one particular athlete. There were signs all over the bike course. There were signs all over the run course, like probably close to a hundred, if not more signs for this one particular athlete. Um, so that was really funny. I mean, it just got to the point where I was just laughing when I saw them because I just, I mean, you never see that many signs for one person. It was incredible. What was the name of the athlete? Do you know? Uh, I don't remember his last name, but his first name was Jeremy. Okay. So go Jeremy. Yeah, and he, did, he, he did. I know he did finish. He did. The, it's all, uh, you know, the Facebook board for, for this year's race was all a chatter about Jeremy and he did finish. So way to go, Jeremy. <laughs> wow. Now going into the little bit harder portions of the run course mentally from like 15 to 18, how are you holding up as far as your mindset? I was, I was, uh, nervous, but feeling optimistic. I felt good. Um, I was, you know, running the plan. I was keeping my heart rate in check. I, I was feeling good, you know, like systems check. My legs felt good. My car, my heart rate was low. Nothing hurt. Um, my nutrition was going well. So I was, you know, I was feeling good. I was feeling uh, cautiously optimistic. Um, because I think, you know, with, at least with my performance last year, and I mean, I've heard other people say this too, you never know when the bottom is going to drop out. Um, and, uh, you know, one minute you could be feeling great and then like a light switch, it's just off and it's over. And so I was just, you know, happy to be feeling good and just really hoping that the, the bottom wasn't going to drop out from underneath me. Um, and you know, I think I managed that by, by running within my heart zone and I, I, I did everything that I, I could to make sure that I wasn't going to blow up. But like I said, you, you never know. So I was, I was thankful for every mile that I was able to keep going and just, uh, hopeful that the next one would be just as good as the previous one okay now whenever you checked in for your, the race and you got your packet and all of that there were probably two wristbands to give away to a spectator or volunteer right there was one just one? just one this year yep okay so do you remember who you gave that to i didn't give it away i forgot to bring it with me on race morning i felt terrible about it oh wow I know. Bummer. Because that's one of the most fun parts of the day. But I just, I forgot this year and I didn't give it to you. But if I had had it with me, there was one particular woman who was um, spectating on River Road, just sitting out in front of her yard. And um, I don't know why um, she just stands out to me in my mind. Maybe I, she may have reminded me a little bit of my own mom. Um, you know, just like this kind of warm, um, older lady who was just out there cheering by herself for everybody that was going by. And she just, I don't know, made me feel like, comfortable and nostalgic and all that kind of stuff so if i had had my bracelet with me i probably would have given it to her okay now we're approaching the miles past 20 yes when do you actually say okay that's it it's time to go so i i was kind of telling myself once i made it off of river road um that and there was i think you end uh river road is around mile 22 um and so i had just kind of said to myself just make it off river road and still feeling good. Like, 
you're you, that's it. You're going to be okay. And actually, it was a really great moment. I saw one of my one of my um, friends that I was traveling with. He was out on his um, first loop of the run as I was running back off Mir- uh, River Road, and and he had a day. He was ill on the bike and just you know was not. It just wasn't wasn't his race. It wasn't his day. Tim, but for Tim, yeah. But he he called out to me on the run and and said, um, you know, how are you doing? And I. I just said to him, I'm great. I'm going to make it. And he was, you know, just, ex- he was so happy for me. And that, that moment in that exchange with him, like, I, I actually think that made me believe I actually, yeah, I am doing great. I am going to make it. And so I, I made that turn off river road and I, I got up, there's a little hill right there. I got up the hill and I just thought, you know, if there's, if there's a time to, to, you know, accelerate and see if I can get my heart rate up a few bits, now's the time. And so, and so that's what I did. Okay. Now, through the run course, did you have an idea of where you were in the race? I had no idea where I was. Um, and on the first loop of the run, when I passed my family, I yelled out to my husband, how am I doing? Meaning, like, tell me where I am in the in the rankings. Tell me my place. And he just yelled out, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Which was super helpful. Thank you. Yes, I, I was. I was feeling great. It was helping. But I had no. So I had no idea where I was. Um, at all. And then when I was coming back um, to run for the final portion of the run, you know, you make that you come up the hills and you make the turn onto Mirror Lake Drive and you run uh, about a mile and a half out Mirror Lake Drive and then you turn around and run back. And my family was right there um, on the corner before I made the turn onto Mirror Lake Drive. And my husband said to me, um, you got to go. She's right in front of you. And my husband's the kind of person who would say something like that, even if there was nobody in front of me, just to make me <laughs> run faster. <laughs> and so I, I just kind of joked around with him. I thought he was just kidding. Um, but at that point, you know, I was at mile 25 and I was just the energy from being back where all the crowds were. I was just, I was, you know, I felt no pain and I really was able to pick it up. And I did, I, I think I ran maybe a 720 that mile. Um, which for me is great at the end of a marathon, at the end of an Ironman marathon. So, I mean, I just hauled up, up Mirror Lake Drive and back down Mirror Lake Drive. Um, yeah, and it was great. But I had no I had no idea. I thought they was just joking with me. I didn't know where I was. Well, in the race. so do you yeah. remember passing number three at around mile 22, 24? I actually – she so she was – he wasn't lying. She was just ahead of me when we made the turn. So I didn't pass her until about mile – like tw- it was – somewhere between 25 and 26 but at that point just because it's a two loop course um and there's there were so many athletes on the course and by the end of the day most of the numbers have been sweated off of people's legs so i don't i don't remember passing her but but somewhere between mile 25 and 26 i did pass her um yeah and, and moved up into second okay now you get done with Mirror Lake Drive, and you're coming around to the oval where the split is. You can go to the oval to finish, or you can go to the second loop. That's right. How was that turning into the oval? I mean, it was awesome because um, I had flipped my watch over um, to just look at my total time for the day, and I had I could see that I was you know at you know ten hours and fifty seven minutes or something like that, and I only had about a quarter mile to go, so. That was um, that was when I realized I was actually going to make this goal of being under 11 hours. Um, and I had um, some of the spectators who were with the other athletes that I was um, staying with were um, right there at the start of the oval. Um, and so I was just getting high fives from them. And I mean, it was just it was ed- everything you could ask for and more for an Ironman finish Um I, I, again, at that point, I didn't know where I was in the rankings, but I was just so elated that I had actually managed to do this thing in under 11 hours. Um, and I just sprinted to the finish. It was amazing. Wow. So how was the red carpet experience for you here? It was awesome. Um, I was so lucky that there were not many other athletes or any other athletes on the carpet or, or finishing with me. So I really had, you know, like that moment to myself, which was amazing. Um, and, you know, to hear Mike Riley call your name and um, it, it, you just can't, there's nothing like it. Um, and then, and to be feeling good um, and just really able to just take it all in. It was real. I'll never forget it. It was great. And then um, my husband was actually able to come to the finish line um, and be the one to give me my medal. 
Um, and so I, I crossed the finish line and he was standing there and that was a big surprise for me. I had no idea. And he, he gave me my medal. And, and I, at that point he told me that I was in, that I had finished second in the age group and I was just blown away. I had, I just had no idea where I was on the course where I was in the rankings throughout the course of the day, which I was happy for. Cause I felt like I just, I ran my own race and I just wanted to do the best that I could do for myself. Um, and that's what I focused on for the day, but I just couldn't believe it when he told me, um, that I had come in second. It was just, it was amazing. Wow. So did you realize at that point that you might be going to Kona when he said that? Um, you know, uh, they, I, I didn't know how many spots there were available for, for the day for my age group, but you know, at that point I knew it was, it was a possibility, um, if there was only one spot, I don't, I, I don't know. I, you know, I thought maybe there was only one spot and I figured the person in first would, would take it. Um, but, um, later on during the day, Iron Man updated their info sheets to show, you know, they wait and see how many people actually start the race before they, they hammer out the final, um, number of slots and how they're going to be allocated for each age group. And I saw that there were two slots for the age group. Um, and so at that point I knew, I knew I was going and it was just crazy. So what was that like? Did as soon as you saw the number two next to female thirty five thirty nine? I mean, I I I just couldn't believe it. I I still almost don't believe it. It's just like, you know, something that you dream about. Um, and, and I can't believe I actually did it. It's amazing. Wow. So looking back on it, how well prepared for this race do you think you were? Um, I think I was very well prepared and I think I was very fortunate to actually be able to get out there and have the race that I trained for. Um, you know, you, you have all these promising rides and you have all these promising swims and you have all these promising runs and, and everybody is watching and everybody says how much potential you have. And, you know, that I don't want to say it's a lot of pressure because I don't, I don't get a lot of pressure. I mean, I think the people around me are just excited to see what's going to happen and, and how you're, how you're going to do, but, you know, you want, you want to just get out there and, and do, do yourself justice, have the race that you trained for. And I really feel like I, I was able to do that, um, on the course. So I'm very thankful. Okay. Now, what is something that you learned about this race that you'd like to pass on to someone who hasn't done this race before? Uh, so for this particular race, I would say that the big you're if you're going to blow it, you're going to blow it in those first three miles on the run. So take it really, really easy coming out of of T2, you're going to be so excited and it's, you're losing 84 feet in that first mile and you're going to fly, but you can really ruin your whole run in those first three miles and, and you can't let that happen. You got a long way to go. Okay. Now for first timers, what advice would you give them? Um, I would just to give them the advice to just soak it all in, especially at Lake Placid. It's such an amazing course. It's such an amazing community. The vibe for all the days leading up to the race and after the race, it's just so special and so fun. And, I mean, I think that would be my advice to first-timers is just, you know, soak it all in and, and make as, memory, and as many memories as you can because it's just an amazing place and you don't get to do your first, your first time twice. Um, so you really got to make it count. Okay. If you could change one thing about your race and do it again, what would you change? I wouldn't change anything about the race that I had this year. I mean, unless I could change the weather, I might change that on the ride. But, you know, I finished the swim and I thought to myself, that was a great swim. And if the rest of the day is terrible, I will feel good about that swim. And then I got off the bike and I said, that was a great bike. And if the rest of the day is terrible, I will feel great about that ride. And then I finished the run and, you know, it was the rest of the day wasn't terrible. It was great. But all three disciplines independent of themselves, I just felt like I had I did the best I could. I wouldn't, I really wouldn't change a thing. Okay. So how could our men have made your race experience better as an athlete? I don't know that there's anything that Iron Man could have done to make my race experience better. Um, the, everything from start to finish is so well organized. Um, the aid stations are so well run. Everything is so clear. The volunteers are amazing. Um, they're really, I can't think of a single thing that Iron Man or any volunteer or anybody could have done that would, that would have, been, they just nail it. They just nail it. It's, it's a fine tuned, well oiled machine. Okay. We covered a lot. Do you have anything yeah. else to add about your race? Um, gosh, I can't think of anything else. No, it was just a, it was just a, a once in a lifetime experience. I loved it. Okay. So, 
you go to the award ceremony the next day. Yes. And you know that you're going to be getting a slot. Yes. How was that moment for you? It was really exciting. Um, and um, a couple of my housemates, Tim and Gina, they came and they're with their families to the awards, which really I thought was so touching. Like they didn't have to come, um, but they did. I mean, they're just such wonderful people and such great athletes to train with. Um, so that was really nice. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was just really exciting to get up there and, and, and ha- have your name announced and, and stand there with the other athletes that placed in the top five. And it was just a really, um, it was a really special moment. It was really, really awesome. Great. Cause they do the award ceremony first and then they do the Kona slots next. Then they do. Yep. Yeah, then they do the Kona slots. So right. You already got on the podium for your award and you know that you're going to be taking the slot, I assume because you yep. got it. Yep. So how was it to actually raise your hand and say, I'm going to Kona? I mean, it was unbelievable. And it's, um, you know, they announced the age group and, and Mike Riley says your name. And I just jumped out of my chair and, and, you know, screamed, yes, I want the spot. I want to take it. And, and then, you know, they, you get your, um, they give you a flower lay and we got a, a hat um, and, you, you know, you fill out your paperwork, you get your, your coin, your commemorative coin, um, qualifiers coin. And I mean, it was just, it was just awesome. So exciting. Wow. You have to send me some pictures of the coin and all the stuff so I can put that on here as well. And oh, yeah, I will. Of the race because like, oh, I would sure. love to have some of those put on there for you. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I have some great, I have some great pictures. I'll send them to you. Nice. So I know you're doing Kona. Aside yes. from Kona, what's next for you? So I am going to be doing um, Ironman Maine 70.3. It's on August 26th, so I've got about four weeks to get ready for that. Um, and then uh, and then it's uh, about nine weeks from there on to Kona. Nice. Or eight weeks. Eight? Seven. Seven weeks. Seven weeks from there. It's 11 weeks, 11 weeks away. Wow. So have you yeah. already looked at travel expenses going to Kona? I did. So, I mean, Placid is the last qualifying race for, for this year's, um, for 2018 Kona. So I immediately, uh, the next day we booked, a we booked a house and we booked our flights and, and we've got all that taken care of. Wow. So is it just you and the husband going or are you bringing other people too? Um, so my husband will come and the kids are going to come and my parents are going to come. Wow. That's going to be yeah. awesome for everybody to just soak that in and experience the Super Bowl. Yeah, they're, the kids are really excited and they've been, I mean, they've been saying since January that they want to go to Hawaii. And I was like, you know, guys, don't, don't get, don't get too excited. We got to, there's a long way to go. You never know what's going to happen. And, and I mean, so I don't know that they really understand. They're only five and seven, but they're pretty excited to go. That's great. Yeah. Now, aside from Kona, what races are on your bucket list? Um, gosh. You know, I really want to get out and do Ironman Texas. Um, I just, it's the terrain there is so different from what I'm used to training in New England um, that I would just be, re- I'm really curious to see how I would do on that kind of a course. Um, so that's on my bucket list. Um, I really want to get up and do Ironman Montremblant. I don't know if I'll do maybe the half or the full. I haven't decided, but um, everybody who goes to that race just talks about how wonderful it is, how beautiful the course is, how much the community embraces the race. So I really would like to be able to get up there and do that race as well. Um, Challenge Roth is on my list out in Germany because that just sounds like a really fun time. I had a friend that did it this year and his experience, um, just seeing his pictures and posts on Facebook, um, made it look really cool. So that would be a great one to do. Um, And then uh, the only other race that I have on my bucket list is to do the big – I'd love to do Boston to Big Sur – um, some year where you go and run, you run the Boston Marathon and then you turn around and run um, the Big Sur Marathon. Um, I think it's a week later or two weeks later and you get a special medal for doing both. Um, so I think that would be a cool experience also. Wow. Yeah. Well, how can athletes follow you? So you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook. It's just Missy Norcross on both. Um, and there I am. Okay, cool. Well, cool. Missy, I only have one more question for you and – that's what's your definition of a perfect race? My definition of a perfect race is a race where you get out there and execute your plan and you run the race that you, uh, you've trained for. Okay. So was Lake Placid this year a perfect race for you? 
it would be pretty hard to top. I mean, I think it was as close to perfect as, as you can ask for. Okay. Well, Missy, I just want to thank you so much for spending some time with me today and sharing your experience. And I look forward to following you at Kona. And just to let you know, if you come down to Texas, I'll be volunteering down there next year. Perfect. So look forward to following you. Have a good day and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you were able to learn something from today's episode. If you enjoy the show, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to see pictures from this athlete's race, learn more about who I am, what I'm doing, or be on the show yourself to share your story, check out my website at CoachTerryWilson.com. Until next time, continue the pursuit.